So, hello everyone. Uh, if there are any new joiners, welcome to OWASP PEPSEC EU 2022 and the exhibitor track. Uh, my name is Kristina Devochko. I am a volunteer in the OWASP community and uh, I will, shall we see? Please wait. Yeah, uh, and um, I will be your moderator for this uh, for this uh, session. Um, shall we see? Uh, so um, during the next forty five minutes, uh, you will be listening to Oliver Williams, who will be presenting a session called "Early, Often, and Everywhere: How to Meet That's the New Mobile, mobile okay. Application Security Imperative." I think I'm hearing some background noise. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, apologies. I, I do have some background noise here. No worries. So please submit any questions uh, that you may have uh, during the session in the QA tab just to the right of this video in the Whova platform. I will be asking Oliver uh, your questions in the last 10 minutes of this session. Uh, Oliver is EMEA Mobile Application Protection Lead at Zimperium and is with us today all the way from Abergavenny, Wales, uh, with deep experience within the cybersecurity industry and mobile web app development. Oliver leads Zimperium's focus on mobile app security across Europe. So, Oliver, are you ready to take it away? Yeah, I'm good to go when you are ready for me to start sharing my screen. Yes, please do that. Thank you. Okay, is that coming through nice and clear? Everything is visible and everything is audible. Perfect. So, hey guys, thank you very much for joining our session today. Um, as we introduced, what we're going to be talking through today is some of our observations and our experience. Uh, in the world of mobile application security. Uh, some of the information that we've gathered throughout various different activities we carry through such as surveying and uh, exploratory uh, research. Um, I will apologize as we go through this conversation. I am at an event today, uh, so there's a bit of background noise. I do apologize for that. Uh, it is a little bit busy here. Um, so we're gonna dive into this. So um, we're gonna start off just by discussing some of the industry uh, conversations that we have, and one of the biggest names out there is Gartner. Uh, Gartner are uh, very much forward leaders in this space. It's an emerging market. It's a very new area, and it's very much uh, growing at a, at a big rate. So we listen to these guys for their observations from a wide perspective across the industry. Um, their big observation for you this year is that mobile application security will be one of the biggest challenges for enterprises. Okay, more apps are out there, more attention is going on to the security of those applications uh, and the reward for uh, exploiting those applications is getting bigger and bigger, okay, especially as we move into the world of payments, etc. Uh, there's a lot more value in those solutions there. We see this as well, you know, we could fill this page, we could have many different slides and, and use on these different stories that come out here all the time. Um, it's almost a, a weekly weekly story now where there's new exploits, new leaks, new challenges uh, that are seen throughout very well-known applications. Um, it's going to keep continuing. Okay, this isn't going to change. This isn't going to go away. The attention is never going to leave the space as well. The best we can do is understand what those challenges are, start addressing them early in the build cycles as we develop these solutions uh, and ensure that we are taking a sensible approach to managing this risk. So some of the activities I mentioned before that Zimperium do is we, we really try to be thought leaders in the space. So um, we regularly survey uh, independently uh, thought leaders in different spaces, technology leaders, et cetera, to understand what are they seeing in their industries, in the spaces that they operate in, and what are the challenges they're trying to explore. So I'm gonna walk through a few of these today uh, with you. Um, so one of the first ones we wanted to try and understand is as you're deploying um, applications and you're addressing the security uh, that is, is required to do this, what are the challenges? Okay, what do you perceive as uh, the downside of addressing this? And the key takeaways really are um, historically there's a big uh, trade-off between applying security measures to a solution 
and how that impacts the user experience. Okay, and this is one of the biggest concerns that we see leaders have in the space. Um, as you then progress through that, it's the impact of the dev cycle. Okay, you still want to be delivering, you still need to be hitting those goals. Uh, you still need to be doing it on the same budgets. Okay, you, you, you bring in security solutions, but you don't want to be bringing in additional security teams to grow their solutions. So it needs to be very low impact from that perspective as well. Um, there's other ones there, you know, there's many other areas, app size, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. User experience is clearly the biggest thing uh, that impacts uh, application security. If we then take another look at another area. Okay, so as we as we start looking into, uh, again, application security, what tasks people are most concerned about, so what areas are technology leaders concerned about the most? Okay. Um, leading leading point in the space right now is data storage data storage and transmission okay so as you collect data or receive data to a solution uh, is it being received securely is it being sent securely is it being generated securely okay and then as you go down the chain it's all about intellectual property and also supply chain attacks as well okay but very much common themes and as we talked about a couple of slides ago these are the things that are driving these attacks that have been seen in the real world. One of the biggest emerging uh, trends that we think we're going to see next, especially be uh, supply chain attacks, uh, repositories being uh, attacked and things like that. And then as we start looking at mobile applications, what is the biggest risk out there? So if you own a mobile application, what is your perception on, you know, where's your attack going to come from? What is the risk? Where's, you know, the data breach going to be caused? Things like that. So the biggest one by far is malware installed on the same device. A very interesting observation for that. Um, and we see that as well in our data set. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit later in our session. But yeah, malware installed side by side with a device. This is really a strong trend right now in the financial markets as well, where uh, Trojans are being designed to target uh, banking applications, etc., uh, posing as uh, banking applications or, or targeting with overlay attacks etc the data in the, in the uh, some other things the phishing campaigns so target phishing campaigns against over a brand or an application and then one of the other big areas as well is application versus engineering so taking an application which is already present on the app store for example uh, repackaging it with maybe malicious code or malicious changes to that solution and then re-release it on the third party app store one of the other areas that we've uh, been working in lately is uh, we released what we term as our global mobile protocol. And this is as Imperium led activity that we carried out uh, over the space of the back end of last year and early this year. And it's really our perspective on what's going on in the, in the, in the world of mobile security, yeah. not just in applications, but in the enterprise world as well. And I want to share some of the key observations that we've had from this. Uh, so, one of the biggest yeah. things we've seen is the mobile specific phishing has been on the rise heavily and this is really driven uh we believe from yeah. the people are now working from home a lot more people are traveling, starting to travel a bit more and okay. this has been driving a focus around phishing where traditionally maybe these type of attacks may have been done on the network level in public hotspots public networks where people weren't visiting those uh, attackers had to shift and uh, they could be the phishing kind of attack so um, a lot of the phishing sites we've uh, actually been analysing that we've been seeing out there are specifically targeted for mobile devices and content that is delivered to mobile devices. Um, so of all phishing sites, the majority of those are focused at mobile device users. Uh, some of the other areas as well. So um, when we looked at, and this, this was a piece of research that we did around uh, financial applications. Okay? So we, uh, analyzed hundreds of the top uh, financial banking payment provider solutions, et cetera. Um, we found that approximately 81% of the applications that were released in that in just that vertical alone are leaking sensitive information. So that could be through uh, cloud storage solutions, it could be through the libraries, it could be the way the code is implemented, uh, or it could be through SDKs that they're importing as solutions, but there is an incredibly high amount of applications out there, uh, not just in the financial sector, we just picked a vertical uh, to analyze, uh, but this is a trend across all the different verticals. And there's many more different uh, metrics that we look for. Okay, I mentioned before, so 
10% of applications use some kind of cloud services in their backend. Again, a lot of these cloud services that people are using um, are not implemented correctly. Okay, so we did a, a big piece of research last year. Uh, we, we looked at over a million different uh, mobile applications plus Android and iOS. And about 131,000 of those use publicly available cloud services inside them. Now these aren't secured cloud services. These are public buckets of information um, which are exposing personal information. So we, we did, had a big drive last year in make, really raising awareness on, okay, well, you're using cloud storage, but are you using it correctly? Yeah, and that was one of the biggest uh, challenges from last year that we observed. Some of the other things from the mobile threat report, um, we, we could we could you know go into a lot of depth on these. And what I will invite you to do is reach out to us following the session, and we can actually direct you to the full threat report on this. Um, last year alone, we discovered over five thousand brand new pieces of malware. Okay, uh, that, that's not across the whole year. That is, you know, on a, on a regular daily basis. Okay. Uh, malware is being generated constantly. It's not new uh, elements of malware. It's being repackaged, being re-released, -re rebranded. Um, it's a very high churn activity getting this malware out there. Okay. There's a massive increase as well on zero-day vulnerabilities that are being used to attack mobile devices. Um, there's organizations such as the Rhodium out there, etc., who uh, acquire and resell uh, vulnerabilities and uh, exploits for mobile devices. Um, last year, uh, sorry, in 2020, uh, as you know, everyone was starting to be put into lockdown, etc. Um, they actually halted their acquisition of uh, iOS exploits because they saturated them. Okay. So there is a big uh, catalog, not in the public view, of exploits against mobile applications. Maybe they could be application focus maybe they're you know for example targeting whatsapp or they may be device targeting uh, both have implications for app developers though so there is a, a big market behind the scenes that we don't have access to or we have visibility of but from just the figures from acquisitions we can see uh, that it is a very ripe market you know there's a lot of money to be made from security resources there. again please do reach out to us uh, if you'd like to get a full copy of this report we're more than happy to direct you towards it so some of the other things I want to talk about uh, just to kind of move towards the back end of the session today um, is to start understanding, you know, some of the questions that we see around different areas of mobile application security, and also talk about some of the best practices that we share with our customers. Okay. So when you start looking across the software development life cycle, there's what we would see as four key areas. Uh, they're the areas that we specialize in as well. Uh, the first of those is mobile security testing. So this is the uh, ongoing assessment of mobile uh, applications as they're being developed on an ongoing automated basis. Okay. And some of the questions that we need to start asking ourselves a lot more is, you know, are we accessing and storing sensitive data? And where are we doing that? Okay. And that's one of the big trends again, as we mentioned earlier on, is about how that data is, is secured safely. Um, and if we start looking into the best practices behind this, you know, as we as we look at uh, building mobile applications, what we recommend to all of our uh, customers and partners, you know, start testing these mobile applications early. Okay, don't wait until you're about to release it or send an application off for pen testing to do a test. Uh, one of the biggest challenges our customers face is um, fail pen tests, and they can fail for very simple reasons. You know, very simple misconfigurations, things that were missing, things were where obfuscation was not applied correctly all these kind of very common areas. So um, start testing early as you develop the application, not when you try to release it. Okay, it will make life a lot easier and it will be a cheaper process as well. You won't have the fail pen tests, you won't have delayed releases, etc. When you do testing, make sure you do both static and dynamic testing. Um, I mentioned before about supply chain attacks. So one of the big areas uh, that we believe in is if you start uh, doing dynamic testing with taking a compiled version of an application, uh, apply it in a, on a physical device and apply telemetry to see what happens as you use it. Uh, we've observed previously where SDKs uh, or libraries that people have found on open source sites or, uh, through supply chains and, and recommendations, though statically, 
those libraries are very benign. So they don't have any malware samples or phishing examples to speak of. But once they are delivered to a device and they are running for a certain period of time, uh, they then change their posture. So they may pull down some new content, they may start working in different ways. So definitely there's a lot of value in both the static side, but also that dynamic testing is critical. These solutions should be highly integrated inside your environment as well. They shouldn't be a new process that you need to adopt and start uh, having new teams to manage. Uh, you, everyone has a CITD pipeline at some sort of people, whether that is they're just using Jenkins to or Git or uh, something like that to store data and just make sure it's centrally accessible. Um, or you are a mature uh, you know, CICD pipeline where you've got all your tools highly integrated. No matter where you sit inside that journey of, of evolution inside the CICD pipeline, um, start integrating early on. So make sure these testing solutions are part of that, that pipeline. Okay, it means that when you promote your builds or you commit new code, those kind of processes, you can trigger the testing. So it means you could trigger testing maybe on a Friday afternoon as you all leave. And then on Monday, when you come back, you'll have a set of results that you can then start uh, analyzing and going into. Um, also on that integration perspective, make sure you're also leveraging things like ticking. So if you're uh, discovering challenges in the applications, one of the best things to do is get this straight back to developers. Okay, make sure that these developers are fixed in these problems as soon as they're identified. It's going to be a lot less expensive on release cycles if you're doing that. The testing criteria as well. So uh, standardization. So um, the solutions that we develop uh, are, are big users of the OWASP standard. Okay, so uh, for example, we just added uh, MassVS to uh, the security testing standard. So every time that you identify issues, make sure you understand what the implication is for a security compliance framework or if you are looking at financial markets pci if it's healthcare hipaa uh or if it's if it's been released in, in europe you know gdpr um so make sure you you're not just testing and looking for problems but also understand where that fits inside in industry standards such as you know mass ds uh, and the, this this should be a collaborative approach. Okay? This shouldn't just be a closed cycle inside the development team. The security and development team should be working together uh, to accept risks if they can't be fit, or at least be aware of risks associated with the end artifacts. So I'm going to move on to the next section, which is all around cryptographic key protection. Okay, so this is really focused around how you secure your keys, your secrets, uh, and how you. Uh, execute things such as encryption, uh, decryption, and some of this. Um, some of the questions that you know we 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 ask our customers and people to consider is, you know, when you are leveraging keys and encryption, do you have a standard practice across your mobile, your web, and desktop applications? Um, one of the challenges that you can fall into is if you don't have a standardized approach or a common approach, a common set of tools, uh, that's when you start leaving gaps. Um, you need to start asking yourself, well, okay, so you're maybe securely generating your keys, but how do you distribute those keys? How do you store those keys? Okay, uh, so you need to make sure, and also when they're being used, okay, to make sure those keys are secured throughout all those different processes. And then also that execution environment, okay, so if you've delivered your key to a decrypt data to a device, how do you ensure that that remains safe even in the most insecure environments? Okay, so even if a uh, device is compromised or jailbroken, you need to ensure that those encryption keys are not taken. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, it's a big area to focus on, uh, but you know, the, the, these are all solvable problems. So, best practice. So, let's talk about the best practice. Uh, never hard code keys in the software. I think it's you know, one of the biggest, most common things that people consider about is you know, don't leave the secrets in plain text or inside your code. You know, don't leave them in a commit to get on the um, But you should never hard code your encryption decryption as well in these solutions. Try and limit your keys to a specific purpose. Okay, So if you are receiving or streaming data, for example, make sure you have a key that is dedicated to that specific purpose. Okay. Reuse of keys is challenging from both a security practice because they're being used a lot more. Uh, but then also, if you're reusing those keys, it can also be a challenge if something changes. Uh, you need to make sure you know, all those keys are then updated. Um, 
when you start looking at the implementation of these kind of solutions, hardware backed security um, is historically a big trend, but it's also a big challenge. So if you look at hardware backed solutions, such as, you know, using Apple Keychain, some of the Google and uh, Samsung solutions that you have out there, uh, it limits the potential user base that you have. You know, it, if you're building a solution that requires some kind of hardware backed security, and you're, you want to have adoption across every single Android device. The cheaper Android devices don't have support for those. Uh, so you're going to be immediately reducing your, your potential user. Um, it's also quite costly, both from a physical and, and uh, consumption basis. Okay, so software-based solutions are definitely the way for a wider adoption. Uh, and to be honest, it, it makes life a lot easier to design and implement these solutions as well. So you're designing a solution for Android in general instead of trying to design a solution for Samsung devices, for Google devices, etc. And make sure those keys are managed throughout your entire solution stack. So it's all well and good, you know, having security key generation, but then how do you deliver those keys to the device? And then also how do you use those keys once they're on the device? Okay. So they're all really, really important things to consider, not just you know, is it securely stored on the back end? Is it securely stored, you transmit it to these devices? Okay, really try to uh, take advantage of white cryptography, what you can, which is it helps address these deep detection gaps that you will have. And moving on to the, the third area is all around shielding. Okay, so this is really focused on uh, anti tampering, anti reversing technology. So, things to ask yourself, you know, what protections do you put in place before you release your app to the app store? You spent a lot of time developing the intellectual property and codes that you're releasing. Okay. Um, it's on open source, um, but that, you know, one, once you, you start building uh, commercial solutions, etc. as well, um, there's definitely challenges around the libraries and some of the embedded elements, you know, some of those need to remain secure because they're doing uh, very bespoke, unique, sensitive uh, activities. So how do you ensure that they are uh, protected against static attacks. Okay. And then also your application uh, against being tampered and republished on actors. Okay, this is a big area, and I mentioned this in the statistics earlier on. Is how how can we ensure that if you're releasing a great quality solution out there, that no one's going to repackage it? We had a recent experience where we were talking to a hotel company. Um, they spent years developing this uh, mobile application for the hotel chain, and they inadvertently, by accident, came across a clone of their application being used by a completely different hotel chain, a completely different company. But they just reskinned their application and reused their application by reverse engineering. So um, there's a lot of challenges out there around how you protect your brands, but also the identity that you're building. Talking about some best practices in the space. Um, there's a, a lot of alignment needed. Okay, so both from the privacy and product security teams, uh, there's a lot of understanding that you need to have and make sure it's clear around things like data classification and how you protect those different areas of data. Okay, so we're not just talking about uh, keys at this point, it's secrets, it's uh, how do you authenticate users and those kinds of things, uh, URLs, strings, all those kinds of things. And then also from the, the product security team, you know, if something does go wrong, what countermeasures do you want to take? You know, which pieces of the code are the areas that if something has been changed, do you need to, you know, respond strongly? And how, do you, how does that response work? Your protections need to be highly tunable. Um, now this is, uh, we mentioned right at the start of the session, the biggest, one of the, one of the biggest challenge for security solutions in mobile applications is the impact on the user experience. So if you just blindly apply security to these solutions, it's going to have a negative impact to these these user experiences. Okay, we, we see it all the time. You have applications that double in size just from static security protections. Um, or you have applications that randomly crash because parts of the code have been incorrectly protected. So we need to make sure that these protections are optimized for not just the, the performance for the user, but then also the size of the device. Okay. And again, you know, once the application is released, you know, are you getting visibility into it once it's released? You know, do you know if something has gone wrong? 
and then what's your approach if something goes wrong? Okay, make sure you have a procedure and a plan behind how you handle the outcome of these protections being put in place. So then the final area that I kind of want to talk about uh, from you know, these recommendations is runtime protection, okay, self-protection. So as you start moving into a space, it's more of an evolving space. It's a, it's a much newer area of protection. Um, there's a lot more questions to start asking yourself as well because it's a deeper area before. So you have to ask yourself, you know, how do you monitor your install base right now to ensure that all these applications you're releasing are not losing data, they're not being abused, uh, do you have visibility? Do you do you have the opportunity to see that? Or is it something that you feel that you could have? Okay. Should you release this application? You know, how do you see end user data, but then also the device and your brand from that application running in an environment that may have malware, a malicious access point, device compromises, elevation privilege, all these kind of different types of attacks that you see out there. Um, how is your application protection against those kind of things? Is it aware of it? Is it going to be all questions to ask yourself? How do uh, you keep that protection up to date as well? So obviously, oh. uh, we missed you for a uh, second there, Oliver. I just, was just wondering if you could repeat the last sentence. You broke oh, up a bit. No worries. No worries. Uh, so we just—I was just saying. So um, the the malware, the types of malware and um, the various exploits that are being developed out there. What we need to do is ensure that uh, the protections that we're putting into place in these solutions are up to date. You know, they are able to protect against these new uh, pieces of malware, these new exploits, new phishing attempts, all these kind of different vectors that we see out there. How are you going to keep that solution up to date so that when these new types of attack emerge, you're protected against them? Okay, it's a really challenging area to, to address. Uh, so it's a really important question to be asked here. Um, and you know, to, to address that, how do you do these things without re-releasing an application? One of the most costly things that we could be asking people to do is redevelop and re-release an application onto the app store every time we put a thing. How do we see this without requiring someone to redevelop? Uh, or you know, just move things into the backlog just to prioritize security. Uh, they're, they're all really good questions. So then if we look at the best practice behind this, um, some of the things we recommend every customer should do. So look at the threat modeling before you approach Rust. Okay. Um, you need to understand you know, what the risk to your application. Okay. So if you, let's say you have a financial uh, banking solution, you need to be able to protect the transactions, the authentication, the uh, data, of the user as a few examples so we need to then understand what the threats to that data could be and then that helps us define you know if an attacker is trying to access those things how they would do it um we need to ensure the threat detection is tightly embedded inside an application but it's also giving the visibility both to the application but also you as uh, a solution provider or a uh, application management team uh, to that visit that threats and the threats and risks that are being seen on, on the device. Okay. Um, we see we see and monitor threats across you know device network applications and phishing. Um, you need to make sure that all those different areas are becoming visible uh, to the application so that you can orchestrate remediations against it. But also you're you're aware of those things as well. Okay. Um, that awareness it, you need to be feeding that back into some kind of scene platform or fraud mitigation tools. Every application is different, every solution is different. The requirements behind it are quite often tied to compliance standards as well. So uh, as we start looking at the future of maybe uh, PCI compliance, um, the focus is going to be shifting a lot more around data collection and data, being, being able to make use of that data as part of the solution. So that data needs to be collected and used in a useful manner. The response policies need to be automated. So there's no point collecting this data or becoming aware of these threats if you're not going to be having automated responses. You know, the time it would take someone on a, a human to respond to this on an application side uh, is too long. If someone is actively hooking into or tampering with an application to try and steal data, that remediation needs to be automated uh, and ready to go when the threat is detected. 
solutions, as and as I mentioned before, you know, one in one of the key questions is this, any solution that is implemented should be able to evolve without requiring you to re-release your application. Uh, we don't, you know, as solution providers and security uh, researchers and companies, you know, we don't want to be advising people to approach security in a way that means it's an overhead for them, um, especially from an ongoing release basis. So what we need to be doing is ensuring that solutions that are being provided are adaptable, they can evolve without requiring new releases and more development time on an ongoing basis. So just to kind of wrap up the session today, I just kind of want to give our perspective on some of the key things that we should be, uh, or you should be asking uh, mobile security vendors, researchers, people in the market, you know, as you start looking at addressing these problems, okay, these are some of the key things to ask. So if you're looking at solutions out there, okay, you need to be understanding not just if, how those solutions are, how can you, uh, you know, secure yourself against attacks. Okay, it's, you, you don't want a binary, yes, it does. You want to understand the, the mechanisms, the solutions, the features that are being implemented to ensure that they're the right mitigations for you. Okay. Uh, we mentioned before about that whole understanding of your uh, requirements behind this, the security approach. It needs to map against the solutions that are being provided. Again, do you have to update your application every time you want to improve the security policy? We don't want to be doing that, so you need to make sure you're not falling into that trap. Okay. What happens if the device is not, you know, offline? So many applications out there, they're designed to be online at the time, um, but there's always a risk where you have cache data on an in, on the device, it goes offline and someone starts tampering with it. Okay, it's one of the things that a security researcher will do, especially if it seems like the application is talking to some kind of cloud-based service to uh, analyze data, metadata, use some kind of machine learning cloud-based service. Um, we need to ensure that if even if the device is not connected to the internet, the protection continues. Okay. Um, the solution should be benefiting you as well from the solution release perspective. So it shouldn't be delaying release cycles. It's, the solution should be helping you accelerate your release cycles, okay? So you need to really, you don't ask the question, you know, is, is this going to stop me from releasing my application or what's the negative impact? You want to be looking for a positive impact on your release cycle. Okay, these solutions are designed to help you. I mentioned before about automated security testing. That should be, you know, one of the things that you're using to ensure that your testing is done early so that you can accelerate and have confidence when you go to things like pen testing. And also make sure you reach out for reference as an example. Okay, so make sure not just have you got a customer using this solution, but how have you helped a customer uh, um, achieve a certain certification? For example, okay, so how did you make that customer successful? Okay, that's really what you want to be looking for. So from that perspective uh, and, and from that uh, comment, you know, that's that's everything I want to walk through today. It's our, our perception on what is happening out there. This is real data, real research that we've been doing. And all of these recommendations are all based on, you know, customer journeys we've been on uh, and people that we work with in the industry. So thank you very much for listening. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Oliver, for uh, this interesting uh, session. Um, shall we see? I think uh, we have a few questions. So the first question would be, um, are there any best practices for reducing the risk to release cycles from failed pen tests that you could yes. uh, mention? Mm. Yeah, so uh, great question. So yes, uh, as I mentioned in the session before, failed pen tests are one of the biggest risk points in releasing a, an application, you know, especially before it's, it's installed on the device. Um, so yeah, shift left security. Okay, so make sure your, your security testing is being done during development. It means you're fixing the problems as soon as they're identified. And it means that as you go to pen test, there's a lot more confidence in that cycle uh, that, you know, pen tests aren't going to be failing for, you know, missing obfuscation and things like that. They're going to be failing for at least a genuine reason, not not something that could be fixed earlier on. Mm. Um, yes, thank you. And uh, are there any 
best or good approaches to handle uh, application security improvements in response to new threats uh, happening every day? Yeah, so using solutions that can uh, Im improve, uh, maybe they are dynamically updated or maybe they are using things like machine learning to uh, not look at threats based on known dictionaries and, and libraries and hashes, but they're using more of a behavior approach to um, focus more on the behavior changes that are happening on the device because behavior changes are a side effect of whatever threat is coming in. So if we abstract away the, the behavior from what's causing the behavior, it means that we can be a lot more intelligent around being future-proof in these solutions. Mm. Absolutely, and the way you mentioned it, that uh, there is uh, new types of there are new types of malware coming out uh, every every day, uh, if not every hour. I mean, uh, you really need to get creative and innovative uh, as well in securing the mobile uh, the mobile industry. Yeah. Uh, and while we are on to that, uh, let's say I am uh, I'm really uh, concerned about the security posture of the of my app uh, of the app I'm developing. So where where should I start? Yeah, so it, and that's a very good question. So it depends entirely around what you're developing. Uh, it, this is a conversation that you should definitely have with security teams, the compliance teams, because. Um, you don't need. You don't necessarily have to have every security solution under the sun. If you're doing things with encryption, decryption, you should definitely be focusing on things like your keys. I believe every uh, every every organization, every every developer, every uh, team can benefit from regular security testing. So regular testing as you're developing code, anyone can benefit from. Uh, as you move into things like, as I mentioned, encryption, decryption. Um, that's that can be a bit more bespoke and based on these demands. Everyone needs some kind of static protection. Uh, you know, there, there's there's never a case that you can argue that you don't need any static protection um, because otherwise you're just leaving yourself open to repackaging attacks or um, you know people injecting code into your application. Those kind of things. And the dynamic approach that is a very much an evolving area. It's definitely something that people should look into around what the runtime threats are to their application uh, and then also how they would, you know, mitigate those, you know, if they were to occur. Mm. Yeah, uh, thanks. And uh, that's that's one thing when I'm the one that is developing an application or when I'm uh, very familiar with uh, with kind of IT and maybe information security. But what what if I am an unexperienced user and uh, even an employee of uh, of a company? So uh, and how do I know that? Um, are there any recommendations on how I can know if this application is safe that I want to download or that I want to use? Are there any like main pinpoints I can be on the lookout for to kind of say, hey, this this sounds this looks shady. I shouldn't I shouldn't probably download that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, there's there's always as someone that spends a lot of time in the industry, there's always sort of you know obvious things out there, you know, free applications that are supposed to be offering you uh premium features and things like that. Um, yeah. Things that are making the package having solutions available to you to test for those kind of things is always good. Um, you know, being able to scan an application, being able to analyze an application. I think the biggest problem that anyone that owns and develops an application will have is what if those applications are installed alongside your application as well? What's the impact as well? So definitely being able to be aware of the presence of those sort of applications alongside your application. That's another really key area. Mm. Yeah. Yes, um, and um, from from your your experience, since you have been uh, communicating with uh, many customers, like are there any any interesting uh, and like scary vulnerabilities you have seen, uh, and uh, kind of what what has the consequence of those of those been? Do you have like your own real life stories? Uh, yeah. Related? Do we. Yeah, we, we, we work a lot of organizations and uh, some have been hacked, some haven't. So there's some companies we work with who have had ransomware attacks. They've nearly lost all of their company data. Um, we've got some customers and, and you know, like one of them, they, they nearly lost all their data and they only managed to survive because they have one server blade out that 
had a copy of all of their active directory exception allowed them to get back online so since then they've been very nervous but from an application perspective there's always risks um you know people may be aware of things like uh, checkmate vulnerabilities for ios so there's hardware vulnerabilities on older I, uh, iphone devices which are su still supported by apple so iphone 8 is an example iphone x um they have a hardware vulnerability in them which can mean that anyone can get elevation privilege on them and it's unpatchable so that effectively means that if you're deploying an, a, a solution to iphone uh you're going to be coming across that okay you can't exclude those devices from your deployment so you have to be you know conscious that you're deploying to devices that will be vulnerable okay these devices will have the capability to be freely exploited um you just need to be you know aware of that and be prepared to mitigate against that hmm. Yeah, that sounds really scary. Uh, I mean, the consequences can be really huge, and and the way the way I feel it, maybe for a at least for a regular user, it's harder to identify if something is potentially vulnerable when you are accessing it from mobile. At least, like on the on the PC, on the laptop, you have like more built-in tools, easier at least to look into the phishing emails, easier to identify if those links are uh, vulnerable. But it might not be that straightforward doing that from the mobile phone and you need to be really like aware of that um i just remember from my own experience like we uh, we have this built-in uh, application that kind of sends you this uh, training phishing emails that you can like report and then you can get points and train yourself on it and once i checked it from my mobile phone and i was actually once really um uh, caught caught by that so uh it, it looked really familiar and i couldn't check the link and i opened this excel sheet that looked like reporting and uh, you know then it said hey you uh, you kind of uh, you got caught here that was that could have been a phishing email so i mean this is this is much harder i feel at least when it comes to mobile security than uh, normal it's, it's, regular it's, web application yeah, yeah the mobile devices are designed to be a lot more user friendly so it's actually a lot easier for an attacker to make a web page look like the web page of another company, make an email look like it's from uh, from Amazon, for example, uh, send you an SMS message that looks like it's from you know your bank. It, mm. It's actually a lot easier to fish and spoof those kind of things on a mobile device than it is a traditional you know desktop laptop environment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, like yeah, we talked about the uh, the applications themselves, but are there any any settings uh, in in the mobile uh, in iOS or in Android like that would be really good to ensure that you have them that you have them turned on? Anything you could recommend to also be proactive on making it more secure to use your phone? Yeah, of course. So I mean, if you're a, a standard user, you've got a iOS device, uh, the best thing you can do is keep it patched. Um, it's the same for any device, you know, don't delay patching. There's no reason to delay your updates. But if you look at the security content behind every single iOS release, so Apple Apple's a very good marketing company. Um, and if you look at every single iOS release, they just list on the cover the new features or bug fixes. And then there's a little link down the bottom that says click here for the security content of this update. When you click on that security content update, it has a lot and lots of CVEs being patched. Now they don't mm. put that on the front cover, you have to go and look for that. But every single release that Apple's putting out are addressing at least some, you know, nearly always, you know, some, some very high CV numbers. Um, every release. And they just don't put on the front mm. cover, you know. Google, Android, it's a little bit more transparent, but there's there's no difference in, in you know, what there's no reason you should delay these updates, okay? Um, I, I don't see any valid reason to, to do that anymore. Things like Android, it's a lot more open, so you've got a lot more access to options. So simple things like, you know, don't enable developer options unless you have to. Don't enable USB debugging unless you have to. These things, yes, they're great for side loading, uh, APKs, you know, free applications, but they actually create a massive security hole on that device as well. So just from a standard user perspective, just ensure your device is not misconfigured. Um, when we work with our enterprise customers, we that's the biggest risk to their organizations that we see. We see we do see jailbroken devices, we see 
customers using uh, our solution and seeing the security, like even in the security teams, people have jailbroken devices and they don't know they've got them until, uh, well, they don't, they, they pretend they didn't know they were jailbroken, but yeah, only when they install solutions to detect these kind of things, they see it. But it's the biggest risk to a lot of enterprises as well is these unpatched and um, misconfigured devices. And probably not attempt to jailbreak your device, uh, <laughs> or at least acquire a jailbreak device either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's always it's always tricky to say don't try and open, you know, make your device more open to you, but you are effectively rooting your device in order to do that. And by rooting your device, you you do create a massive security hole on that mm. device as well. Absolutely, that's a very very good point. Um, yes, I think we uh, we are getting to the end uh, of our questions. But one uh, last one, a more general one: Are there any other upcoming events or conferences where you are going to speak, where we can see you next time? Uh, so we we do have many uh, events coming up. We're going to be doing a lot of uh, our enterprise ones with a lot of our OEM customers coming up. Um, we do have a section on our webpage where we talk about our upcoming events in different regions so across uh, europe the, the globe um i'm actually talking today is i'm well i'm at money 2020 in amsterdam at the moment so uh been doing a lot of work with some of our financial customers as well and the upcoming uh, standards inside the financial markets um so there's always events coming up that we're going to be at um best way to do that is always look at our webpage uh yes. to see where we're going to be speaking and, and attending yeah, very cool. But uh, thank you, thank you once again for an interesting session, Oliver, for a uh, for a good discussion on an important topic of mobile security. And uh, I would also like to thank all of our participants who have joined this session today. And uh, next up is uh, one hour lunch pause for all of us. But after that, we are ready to go again. Uh, and in the exhibitor track, we'll be kicking off after after lunch with Adam Brown, who will present over a decade of software security, what have we learned? And if you would like to check other sessions that will be happening in other in parallel tracks, uh, please do check the agenda on the Whova uh, platform. So I would like to thank everyone once again, enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thanks all.